Warsaw was the home of the largest Jewish community in Europe. When the ghetto was established in 1940, more than 400,000 Jews were crammed into an area of only 1.3 square miles. That is more than 11 times the population density of New York City. This was done intentionally to kill off its inhabitants through starvation and disease. And to keep everyone in, the Germans built a wall to surround the ghetto. Today, only two pieces of the wall remain, and that will be our first stop today on our tour. So this is the wall of the Warsaw Ghetto. As you can see, look how high it is. It's really high up there. They wanted to make sure that no one could escape the ghetto. And of course, the reason why this is still intact and why General Stroop didn't destroy it, of course, is because um, as time went on, the Nazis made the ghetto smaller and smaller. And by that time, Mordecai and the ZOB went fighting. This was already outside the ghetto. But this is one of the only places where the ghetto wall remains to this very day. So, of course, there's nothing like come on up and touch it. So, why don't you come up and touch it? <laughs> oh, yeah. Touch the wall. Nice, Jacob. Oh, 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 oh. Okay, Jake, you just put a rock over there and against the wall. Do you want to tell us what you did? So it's a Jewish tradition. Like some people leave flowers at graves. Uh, Jewish people leave rocks and stones because they last forever. So it's just a commemoration to the Jewish people that died here, which is why people put stones and whatnot in the holes in the wall. A few yards away is the other section. And this is one other section of the ghetto wall right here, not too far from where we were just before. Get a little bit lower as you can see. This was the standard height of the wall. So if you were daring, this was possible to jump over. As you can see, it's about eh, eight and a half feet tall or so. Placing our hands in the wall is a symbol connecting us with the past to remind us how real the Holocaust was. Yep. <laughs> Just a couple blocks away from the wall fragments is the site of the orphanage run by Janus Korshak. He was a famous pediatrician, author of children's books, and the caretaker of a Jewish orphanage in Warsaw. During the liquidation of the ghetto in August 1942, the orphans were selected for transport, and the rest is history. This is the site of Janus Korshak's orphanage in the Warsaw ghetto. This was the final site of his orphanage. It was from this very spot that all of his children were walked all the way to the Umschlagplatz and sent on the train cars to Jablinka. As we all know, Dr. Korshak refused to leave his children despite the Nazis telling him he didn't have to go. He went with them right to Jablinka where he died with his children. So this is the exact site of where the orphanage was in the Warsaw Ghetto today. And this is a monument dedicated to his memory. The tree is in the shape of a menorah. And as you can see on top, there's a little branch growing to symbolize that the tree is not yet dead and the new Korshak spirit lives on. Ooh. 
Our next stop is on Prozhna and Wolokov Street to see the only remaining buildings from the ghetto to survive. Here I am now on Prozna Street. It's a very important place. On both sides of the street are original buildings from the Warsaw Ghetto. It's one of the very few places where the buildings are still intact today. As you can see, they're in the process of renovating them. They already did this side, but on this side, you can still see the original structure. As you can see, this is the original stuff from the ghetto time. Okay, it's a big piece of history because it's one of the only places left in all of Warsaw where the ghetto inhabitants lived and the buildings are intact. As you can see, this is one of the places where they housed Jews during uh, World War II, part of the ghetto. And across the street, if you can see there, it was the walls of one of the factories. It actually still has damage from the war. The building on Wolokov Street and the garment factory across from it are left unrenovated as memorials to the Warsaw Ghetto. Our next stop is at Cholna Street. This road divided the ghetto into two sections, which the inhabitants called the Little Ghetto and the Big Ghetto. In order for the Jews to have access to both sections, they built a bridge, and it became a symbol of the ghetto. Today, a memorial stands on the exact spot. We're on Cholna Street. This is the site of the bridge that separated the little ghetto and the big ghetto here in Warsaw. This is the memorial to it right here. And over there, as you can see, people are looking in, um, looking in the thing there. Right there, they are actually looking in to see pictures of what it was like in the Warsaw Ghetto back in the 1940s. Hi, so I'm looking through these goggles at pictures of what the bridge looked like. Right here is where the bridge used to be. And in these pictures, you can see people walking from the small ghetto to the large ghetto because that was the only way to do so. Cool. Let's see if we can take a look inside here for the folks back in the classroom. Oh, you see it? That's the original bridge right there. What do you know? Just a few feet down Trona Street, is the one-time home of Adam Chernyakov. As leader of the Warsaw Ghetto, Chernyakov had the incredible burden of choosing who would be selected to be sent to Treblinka. When the Nazis forced him to send the children of the ghetto to the death camp, Chernyakov committed suicide instead. Also on the street is a Catholic church, which represents a little-known fact about ghetto life. Here, also on Cholna Street, are two very important things when it comes to the Warsaw Ghetto. The first is behind me, this white building here. This was Adam Chunyakov's house, the head of the Judenrat. This was his main residence. And if you look down the road, you're going to see a church. Now you might be saying, what the heck is a church doing in the ghetto, right? That's because, don't forget, in Germany, not in Nazi ideology, being Jewish was racial, not religious. And so there are many people who are religiously Christian who had to live in the ghetto because the Nazis considered them Jews too. So it's a very important street. As our tour continues, we come to the site of the ghetto prison known as Powiak. Okay guys, our next stop in the Warsaw Ghetto Tour is Powiak Prison. You know there's always a place that you never want to go to? This is the place in the ghetto that you would never want to go to. Right? This was the infamous ghetto prison. The original structure is destroyed except for one piece. This one piece right here, one of the original gates and of course the barbed wire fence. The Nazis would put people in combat prison for any reason what they felt like it. Up to 100,000 people during World War II were in prison at this spot. And that's why today it's a very large memorial to all the inhabitants of the Warsaw Ghetto. 
Over a hundred thousand people were sent to Pauyak. A third of them were executed, and the other two-thirds were sent to concentration camps. During the ghetto uprising, Pauyak prison was used by the Nazis as a base to attack the Jewish resistance. The building was destroyed in 1944, when the Polish people rose up against the Nazis. Along with the pillar at the entry gate, a few detention cells in the basement are also preserved. Now, we come to the very spot where the Jews of the Warsaw Ghetto were rounded up before being sent to Treblinka. The Umschlagplatz. Okay, let's go in here. Plus. This was the big area that was a square area where all the Jews of the ghetto would be transported to before being transported on the trains to Treblinka. This is where they all gathered. Guys, approximately over 300,000 Warsaw Jews were put in this place. And they were put in this place in January and July when it was 10 degrees or 110 degrees. Many people died in the Umschlagplatz. People left all their possessions behind the Umschlagplatz. So that's why there's a memorial here today at this very famous spot. This was basically the last place people stayed before being killed in the gas chambers at Treblinka. The railroad line used to be right behind this memorial where the buildings are. And of course the square was a little bit larger than the memorial is. But you get the, the feeling of what this place meant to all those people who were being killed in the Holocaust back in 1942. Are there any questions? In Poland, they don't have the word plots in like their vocabulary. Why right. is it called the Umschlag plots? Good, guys, if you notice, it's called Umschlag plots. That doesn't sound very Polish, that's German. Because it was known as Umschlag plots during this time. It was so famous as that, they couldn't change the name. That's why it remains German, even though we're in Warsaw, the capital of Poland. Good question. Any other questions? Okay. We now come to what is probably the most emotional spot on our tour. As we walk up what else but Mordecai and the Levitt Street, we come to his final resting place, the ZOB headquarters at Mila 18. Here we are, the main base, Mila 18. This is the spot where Mordecai and a hundred of his followers are buried. Okay, this is the most sacred spot in our entire tour today. We are at the address of the place we're at right now is Mila Street number 18. Mila Street 18 was the headquarters of the ZOB, the Jewish Fighting Organization. This is where Mordecai and Levitch and his followers planned and organized all the attacks against the Nazis. Um, it was very ironic because Mila 18, does anybody know what business stood at this spot 75 years ago? It was a house of ill repute, if you know what I mean. <laughs> and they decided what a better place to do it because they know the Nazis will never come to a place like this in the Jewish ghetto. This is where they coordinated all their efforts. And guys, unfortunately, this is also the final resting place of Mordecai and about a hundred of his followers. Mordecai was killed in the attack. The Germans did find this place. They did launch poison gas there. They dynamite it with grenades. And so his body, along with a hundred others, are buried under this mound right here. This was their headquarters and their final resting place. Remember, these guys, they lasted five weeks. The entire country of Poland lasted four weeks against the Nazis. So they humiliated the Nazis. So in the end, Mordecai was right. They died, but they died with honor this time. They were not gonna give up and they were not gonna die at the gas chambers at Treblinka. So if you go up the steps to the monument, you could read it and you'll see Mordecai and Levitch's name in there too. As Mordecai was only 24 years old when he died. So he's one of the bravest people in the Holocaust, and he's my favorite character in the entire Holocaust. All right, so come on up and check it out. So this 
This is a gravestone of Mordecai and Elephant. This is the spot where he's buried. About 50 feet under me lies Mordecai and Levitch and more than 100 followers of the ZOB. This is their final resting place at the site of their headquarters, Mila Street, number 18, here in Warsaw. Of course, here is their tombstone with Mordecai's name on it, along with many others. And this is just a symbolic area of Warsaw dedicated to all those who fought and died uh, for their freedom against the Nazis. Just two blocks away from the Mila 18 site, is the memorial placed where the ghetto uprising began. Hey class, welcome to the Warsaw Ghetto Monument dedicated to all the fighters in the Warsaw Ghetto. The guy in the middle is Mordechai and Levitz and he was the leader of the ZOB. And Mr. Butchko's favorite person in the whole entire world. Favorite character in the Holocaust. <laughs> of course, right? Time, the German Chancellor kneeled down in front of this monument and that was a really big deal. Yeah, that was a big symbol of reconciliation. Yeah. So this is the monument dedicated to all the fighters in the ghetto uprising. And of course, Mordecai Levitch is the guy, the big guy right in the middle there. It's a very, very big thing here in Warsaw. Our last stop today is to visit the brand new Museum of the Polish Jews, located right next to the ghetto uprising memorial. Inside are many rooms dedicated to Jewish life in Warsaw, and the ghetto uprising. So here we are at the Holocaust Museum, and we're in the room where it talks about how Poland's, Poland's history, history and how the other countries kind of um, gobbled it up. Gobbled Poland up, and Poland ceased to exist in the late 1700s. Here are the rulers of the other countries. And then we have uh, King Gabriella. King. <laughs> Hello, my cousins. <laughs> The Polish throne with the queen. <laughs> oh, cool. It is cool. So, so you want to become the subject of the Prussian king. First answer questions about the following. Well, I'd rather be subject to the Bavarian king, of course, but Prussian king? Okay, so I'll work. <laughs> Have you lived here before? It's not, yeah. right? You can't live here. Leave of your own volition or you'll be banished. Bad <laughs> luck. You cannot live in the kingdom of Prussia. Oh, darn it. So what this game is explaining to you, it's basically explaining the, the, the choices the Jewish people had. And could they live in Prussia? Austria or Russia because those three countries had gobbled Poland up and now the Jews are being basically being kicked out of their, their neighborhoods which they've lived in for centuries. It was a very horrible thing that happened to the Jewish people of Poland but it's amazing how they made it come alive right here at the museum. Everyone's having a great time. Pan around. <laughs> We found this quote from Adam Trinyakov's diary that really explains a lot about his thoughts just before the great action began. That's a hand grenade. This is a brick from one of the buildings. These are fuses the ZOB used to light Molotov cocktails. And this, of course, is a shotgun the ZOB used. Incredible. This building that you see here, the model, this was an important structure in Warsaw. This was the model of the great synagogue of Warsaw. It was the biggest synagogue in all Poland when it was built. And this was a huge symbol of the days of Poland. 
When the whole army, when the, when the uh, Jewish rebellion happened, Mordecai and Levitch, and they all rebelled, on the very last day, when General's troop had figured out that the rebellion was over, he put dynamite all over this building, and to symbolize the Nazi victory over the Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, he blew this building up. They do, in this museum, they actually do have a piece of one of the pillars of the Great Synagogue. Today on the site is a huge skyscraper, though, and they call it the Blue Tower. But there is a plaque right at the bottom that tells people the history that this was the Great Synagogue of Warsaw up until the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. So this is what it used to look like. The biggest synagogue in all Poland. I'm at the site of one of Warsaw's biggest skyscrapers today, the Blue Tower. But before, in the 1943 and before that, this was the site of the Great Synagogue here in Warsaw. This is a memorial to it. The Great Jewish Synagogue was destroyed by General Stroop at the end of the Warsaw Uprising, basically to announce that Warsaw had been freed of all Jews. And this is the last act that they did before uh, it was declared to be free of Jews. So this is a memorial to the site of the Great Synagogue today. So I hope you found our tour of the Warsaw Ghetto interesting and educational. The story of this place is monumental, and I hope this spurs your interest in learning more about it. And of course, I'll see you on our next in-class field trip.